Hello everyone, and welcome to 2024. Um, so I read 57 books uh, last year. Before I get onto the best books, I'd like to point out some honorable mentions. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10. Okay, so my first honorable mention is The Heroes by Joe Abercrombie. I'm currently making my way through um, his Age of Madness trilogy and his books have been such a delight. After reading The Blade itself, which I thought was good but it didn't blow me away, I would never have guessed that this series has quickly grown to be one of my all-time favorites. I'd love to ask him a question what kind of theory of humanity he has because his books are just so bleak, and I know that they're grimdark. The Lord Grimdark moniker is definitely um, appropriate. <laughs> but I'd love to know if he does believe that at the heart of itself, humanity is evil or good or the blank slate theory. Uh, the book Leo did actually a very good video about this while analyzing A Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, so I highly recommend it. But yeah, The Heroes is his second standalone in the First Law universe and coming into it I didn't expect much. I thought it would be my least liked standalone because I'm not really a huge fan of war stories but oh my gosh, I was so pleasantly surprised. Surprise, surprise. Surprise, surprise. It was a beautiful story and heartbreaking story examining the battlefield in a very realistic sense. It's not realistic in the sense that he is a great strategist like uh, Robert Jordan, uh, like he literally has a cavalry for like the peasants that never rode horses before and that doesn't really seem like a monetarily good idea, but good in the sense and realistic in the sense that I bought into the idea that the characters that were on either side of the war really would have gone through those emotions and that they're realistic in the sense of how war affects them. War. War never changes. I really liked the um, complementary nature of the characters as well, where some seem to be the older versions of other characters like Kurt and Craw and Beck, uh, one of whom is an older man who really wants to leave the army even though he's been entrenched in it all his life so he finds it very difficult too and the other one being a young boy who wants to join join the army and earn a name for himself um, and doesn't really think of the consequences of what that might entail but yeah overall amazing book highly recommend so the next book that I really want to highlight as one of my favorites is Wuthering Heights and I reread Wuthering Heights this year because I wanted to try a book from each of the Bronte sisters. I actually made a video about that as well so I just need to edit that but Wuthering Heights was just so beautiful. I love romantic literature and Wuthering Heights was so interesting in how it plays with familial dynamics and nature versus nurture. It's I honestly recommend you read it alongside Frankenstein. <laughs> I think both of those books have very interesting conversations about that. And this connection between nature versus nurture is really personified in the environment, which I thought was so interesting because of the two houses, you know, one of them being Wuthering Heights and the other being Thrushcross Grange. One is personified as like the evil castle at the top of the hill and the other one is like the beautiful house with the nice garden and and then that also kind of reflects how the characters in, that live in the two houses develop. Um, yeah, I also the ending love the ending. I think it's very ambiguous and I honestly really like that because it just invites you to think about the story long after it is finished. The last book on my runner-up list is The Kind Worth Killing by Peter Swanson. It maintains a breakneck pace as well as loads of intrigue between the dual storylines. One of a girl named Lily growing up in her parents' house where they party a lot and don't really take care of her, as well as Ted who believes 
that his wife has been cheating on him with a man who they paid to build their house. I really enjoyed the way these stories intertwine and simultaneously asks the reader to think about the morality of murder and vigilanteism. Garlic. Onions, garlic, celery, balsamic vinegar. Tomato paste. That's a big word for Elmo. I wouldn't say it's as deep as The Heroes or Wuthering Heights, but still very good to get you out of a reading slump. Okay, so now getting into my top four books of the year. Ladies and gents, this is the moment you've waited for. The first one is In My Dreams I Hold a Knife by Ashley Winstead. This book is like, actually, I don't know what the author, like, put in those pages, but I read it in a day. It's not deep. It's not deep. But it's very addicting. It is also, it's like this dark academia, murder mystery kind of thing. I think if you liked The Secret History, you're gonna like this. You know, it doesn't really rely on the academia as much, but it does have that same element of it's a group of friends, one of them was murdered, and we're kind of led to believe that it was someone from the front group, but we're not really sure who it is. Whereas like in The Secret History, you, you, you do know kind of basically what happened. Um, but here it's not really confirmed. And so what happens is 10 years after they graduate, the students have a re reunion at their university called Duke University. And we fold out load the perspective of Jessica Miller. And it's once again a dual timeline. Uh, one of the timelines is of Jessica in the past and we kind of see their story and the bonds of the friends um, while they are in university together. And then the second storyline is of Jessica coming back and having this reunion, right? The feeling this book gives you is of being back in high school or college or whatever and getting that juicy gossip and being like, oh my god, what the hell is going on? Like crazy. I miss this feeling so much. The plot twist, like, kind of foreseeable, kind of not, but there's enough of the twists and turns, whether it comes to the interpersonal relationships of the characters or the mystery of who killed the friend, uh, her name is Heather. There's just so much to keep you occupied. Had loads of fun. If you're in a reading slump, this is the one to read. In third place, I have The Gathering Storm by Brandon Sanderson and Robert Jordan. So I'm very proud of myself because this year um, I actually finished The Wheel of Time. It took me two and a half years to read The Wheel of Time. Two and a half years. But if you're curious what took me so long to read the series, I have two words, yeah? Winter's Heart. People like to say that Crossroads of Twilight is the worst one and the most boring one. No, 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 no. It's Winter's Heart. Yeah, I get it that the final chapter is really cool. I, I agree. Everything before it, though, 100 times worse. Don't burn me alive at the stake. I said what I said. Bitch, I said what I said. Anyway, The Gathering Storm is a masterclass in building tension in the plot simultaneously as in with the characters, right? Uh, I'm not gonna spoil anything, don't worry, but the two main characters that are the focus here are Rand and uh, Egwene, and their stories mirror each other's in reverse almost, where Egwene slowly is like rising from like bare bottom uh, to the top and advancing, you know, socially, politically, just so much intrigue in that plot. Rand starts off at the top and he starts to decline. Th th there's so many things revealed in this book at the end as well that just make that feeling of euphoria so much better. Sorry, that's my cat meowing. This is the cat. I hope she stops meowing. But, okay, where was I? <laughs> I would say that not having um, that final confrontation, I guess, for at least one of the two storylines really worked because it just showed that that, that sometimes the inner demons and a character just fighting with themselves is just as compelling as fighting an opponent and sometimes that the biggest opponent you can have is yourself. Loved it. My number two book that I read this year left me not being able to sleep without the light turned on for two months and it's this one here, uh, House of Leaves. I don't even know what I can say about this book. I, I don't know. It's 
It's the craziest thing I've read in my life. You know how Harry Styles was like... My favorite thing about the movie is like, it feels like a, like a movie. It feels like a real like, you know, go to the theater film movie. This is that th same thing, but like in book form. There's no audiobook. I can't even imagine how they would make a movie of it, you know? Like, basically there are three-ish layers to the narrative. There, you have the Navidson uh, record. And the Navidson record is this documentary that may or may not exist about this guy. Um, I believe he's a Pulitzer Prize winning photographer and he decides to set aside uh, his photography days and prioritize his relationship with his partner Karen and move into this house to commemorate the rebuilding of their relationship. But then everything devolves when he starts to realize that the, that the house might be slightly bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. However, the document, the Navidson record, that we are reading in the book House of Leaves is actually a literary analysis of the document. So we learn about the plot through the eyes of the critics that have seen this documentary. However, this record has been written by a blind man called Zampano. So Zampano in himself would not have been able to watch the actual documentary if it existed. And the character who finds this document in literally the first uh, chapter then tries to, in, in the world, right, tries to confirm the existence of this documentary, but then is unable to. Like, there are many people commenting on this documentary in the book, like Stephen King, uh, my favorite critic, Harold Bloom. <laughs> Bless. He's so funny. Um, and might I say, Mark Z. Danielewski really did a great job impersonating Harold Bloom. But the record, the Navidson record, the documentary doesn't even exist in the world of jo Johnny Truant, the guy that finds the papers. So then you have also the level of Johnny writing footnotes and like telling his story and how the record, um, or rather the Zampano ma uh, text affects him while simultaneously we find out very early on that he is actually prone to changing Zampano's text itself. We have layer upon layer of unreliable narrators. It's simultaneously a love story, um, a satire of literary critique, honestly a masterclass, and some people would say that in the end it's supposed to be meaningless, and to some extent, I actually do agree, however, I don't think that that means that it's less valuable. And now, my favorite book of the year, which blew me away. Once again, read it in a day. I cannot say enough about this book. And it is titled Recursion by Blake Crutch. It was the only five star I gave this year. I'd like to read you a quote from this book to illustrate what I believe the thesis of the novel is. There are so few things in our existence we can count on to give us the sense of permanence of the ground beneath our feet. People fail us, our bodies fail us, we fail ourselves. But what do you cling to moment to moment if memories can simply change? What then is real? And if the answer is nothing, where does that leave us? Often we believe that memories are um, stable, you know, that what happened in the past stays in the past and that it isn't fickle. However, Memories are malleable, and the way we remember things aren't often synonymous with what happened in the absolute truth. And this novel asks the questions of to what extent is memory important in the formation of our identity as well as the collective identity of the world, right? Like history. It does it brilliantly. It's written as like a thriller novel, so it's constantly taking you on plot twists and turns and... <clears throat> I love it because it's a hard sci-fi book. It's a hard sci-fi book, right? It, it explores like ideas in science but takes them to the extreme and however it's written as a soft sci-fi book because Blake Crouch understands that okay you can write about some abstract thing about memory and identity and stuff like that however we won't care unless we hear about it from like the more human perspective, right? This is why like it's more effective, at least in my opinion, to read like um, a memoir of a survivor of a war than it is to read like, oh yeah, this war killed like this many people, like because if you reduce people or 
events to just numbers on a page, like, it's just a number, you know, like, we don't feel empathy towards it. This man, oh, he builds empathy for the characters so well, and it just... I think I might just put a knife in I it. I think that's a really good idea. See if it works. Oh, yes, it, oh, it goes in beautifully. beautifully. Cuts you out your feelings and really makes you ponder your life as well and, like, reevaluate a lot of things while getting the concept, the more science fiction aspects across as well. Like, it's a masterclass. I cannot recommend it enough. Okay, so that's everything from me. My goal for this year is to start this channel and have this way of documenting what I read. I wanted to do this for a long time, but I was just really scared and I still am to be honest. Um, but Logan Ninefinger says from the first law books, it's better to do something than to live with the fear of it. So I'm kind of using that as my motto going forward. So yeah, see you soon, hopefully. Bye!